¿Cómo estás, Beto? ¿Qué tal, David? Muy bien. Domingo Muy bien. en la mañana, domingo tempranero. Hoy nos vamos hasta Alemania, si no me equivoco. ¿eh? A Alemania, exactamente. Estamos con, de invitado con Max, que es encargado de, de famoso canal de videos de YouTube que se llama Analog Insights. Entonces, ¿por qué no lo presentas, Beto? Sí, pues tenemos aquí con nosotros a, ya aprendí a decir el apellido, Max Heinrich, desde Alemania. <laughs> eh, Max, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, for me, it's a Sunday evening and I had a pretty relaxed Sunday, so I'm really good and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Perfect. How are you guys? Perfect. We're fine, we're fine. Right now it's like uh, close to noon right here in Mexico City, so that's why the sun and all the all that kind of stuff, like, <laughs> very sunny day. <laughs> yeah, we hope we hope we, we we will have a relaxed Sunday like you after this this little chat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Max, let's start with the interview. The, it's, uh, we, we want to know about you all and your photography style and your photography work. Uh, so, can you introduce yourself? Who is Max Heinrich? Uh, who, who's Max Heinrich? Yeah, um, I started a YouTube channel a couple of years ago when this was still something new to do that as in our generation to really do full film photography again. And um, mm. um, This is why I'm here today. So this is that part of me, a, a film photographer, really passionate about film photography and slowly getting to know other people in that sl very small community. And um, over time, seeing as the channel expanded Analog Insights, um, that there are a lot of people internationally um, also increasingly getting into film or older people kind of dusting off their old cameras um, on the shelves and starting uh, yeah. to shoot um, film again. And I can actually see that in our in our demographic insights on um, YouTube. Um, you can really see the age dis distribution of um, exactly as I mentioned, older people getting back into film and um, people our age um, and even younger increasingly getting into film and being really curious about it. And um, yeah, for me, I got into photography fairly late in my own life, um, actually via my first job at, at Siemens. So that big engineering company, um, I was Um, working as an internal reporter. And at one point, my okay. my boss at the time put a Canon 5D Mark II um, into my hand and said, okay, you can actually film with that thing, start doing that. And this is my first access that I had to photography, actually filming with such a camera. And only okay. later on, I got into photography. And then at the age of 30, purchased my, my first real camera and At both a digital camera and an analog camera quickly um, after each other and also asking my dad could I get your old um, analog camera a uh, mean old xd7 and mm. this is basically the setup that I then had to, and to learn and to learn about exposure to learn about all the basics aperture and uh, shutter speeds and, and, and film ISO and, and so forth <laughs> and yeah this is how I how it all started and Fairly soon afterwards, I think about a year afterwards, I decided to start the channel to give other people a shortcut and an opportunity to yeah. be faster in terms of accessing this beautiful area of film photography. Yeah, that is great and we're thankful, thankful for that because uh, every channel that gives you insights, um, even if it is a film, a camera, a lens, anything, any shortcut, It's it's so great because it it, it takes you that load of, of, of okay I need to buy this I need to try this and, and if I don't like it I may, maybe I need to sell it I need to return it and this is, so these channels are very very useful and very we are very very grateful as 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 viewers because they really are a shortcut and they really save money for for other people. <laughs> 
Yeah, or, and that's also yeah. how it's meant, right? As a service um, to to the analog community, because personally, I benefited a lot in the beginning from especially blogs, and there were only very few YouTube channels at the time. Um, Matt Day's channel was um, already around, and that was uh, still fairly small. Um, Nick Carver was already around, but not as professional as he is by now. And and these were my primary sources, um, just uh, just as you described, and and seeing how that benefited my own learning curve as especially reading, but also then watching some videos, I thought, okay, it might be a good idea to, to do that. And yeah. one more remark, I have a journalistic background originally, so I'm doing communication. Mm -hmm. And I was at the time I was looking for an additional outlet to do what I did at Siemens again, to really create small videos, tell stories using the video and also get back to my editing skills, which was, which were really bad already at the time so it was time to, <laughs> to improve them again and and these reasons combined kind of led to, to the creation of the channel yeah and actually your right. youtube channel i saw two videos the one is from how do you uh, review the minolta x 7 and you told that story about that your father gave this camera to you and also i saw a video about uh, contacts rts that you mm -hmm. your grandmother or your yeah right something like that right mm -hmm. um my aunt in this case um, aunt. she yeah she, she she passed it on um to me she used to work at carl Zeiss and um as part of that also got a couple of great card size lenses and also a Contax RTS. And when I stumbled upon that camera, that was of course a really exciting um, experience to, to have that. Um, and, and for her as well to see it passed on in the family and have somebody who's really excited about it. And the same with my, with my father, because at the time the camera was already at my sister's place. She lives in Denmark in Southern Denmark and um, was basically in a box. And she um, said, Oh, of course I still have these cameras and just sent me an entire box of great Minolta gear that my dad wow. basically used to, take my ch child children uh, photographs all of them and that of course was important and i really had uh, i mentioned that in one of the videos i really had a very strange first phone call with my dad asking him about really basic questions like what kind of film do i buy and he was like yeah you know when i was still doing this there was this um this British company called Ilford. Maybe they're still around. They should still be around. <laughs> they they did great black and white film. You should check these uh, them out and and look at Kodak as well, of course. And then he explained to me, okay, you can get this ISO 100 film, maybe for starters, an Ilford FP4 that always did a great job. And this is how I slowly really got from the very bottom um, into it and and learned. Yeah. Yeah. I think you 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 are very lucky, and I don't know. Maybe it's it's a perception thing, but we think that in Germany they they you have a access to a lot of cameras, a lot of film, a lot of gear more than than Mexico or Latin America. Yeah, yeah, that that might be might be true, um, and and of course there's a lot of heritage and connection to these kinds of, of cameras and also brands to Leica mm -hmm. in particular, but also Carl Zeiss and, and even in um, Eastern Germany. So the um, former German democratic Republic, um, mm -hmm. the, the, like you do have a lot of companies that were focused on creating lenses and, and things like that. And it, it, even that small family connection here shows that. And I have another family connection where just recently, um, basically my cousin's father passed on his, um, his father's <laughs> Leica 3A to me. Wow. And that's uh, to, to realize, okay, there are Leicas in my family or just this one um, was also one of those, these experiences. And this, I think, uh, happens only in a few places and maybe Germany is one of them <laughs> where you, where you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, actually that, that bond that you have with those, those cameras, that's very, very interesting because, uh, you have, <laughs> I don't know how, how do you, um, take that, that you realize that all that kind of brands and cameras are in your homeland. And you can mm -hmm. you can access very very quick and very easy. Uh, that's amazing 
for for a German guy who want to start uh, on field photography, it's like paradise over there. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, I think Japan is kind of similar. Also, if you're yeah. interested in brand new or almost brand new mint condition um, film cameras, and uh, I keep admiring Bellamy Hunt as the Japan camera hunter and yeah. what he's doing over there oh, and going yeah. through these stores in his vlogs. And I'm like, okay, wow, this is amazing. This is not something that you see a lot here in Germany. Here it's more like really um, older people, um, yeah, really dusting off their shelves and then uh, opening them up and selling old cameras where they feel like they're not worth anymore, anything anymore. And then slowly realizing, okay, they are. And, and so you have a lot <laughs> of stock material basically um, um, still around. And as you notice, the prices go up uh, yeah. to an incredible degree. When I, when I got into film photography, when I, when I was 30, I purchased my Leica M6 for around um, 960 euros, I think, from um, somebody in, in Berlin. And by now, the price is almost like 1,500 or 1,600 on average, I think, even more. And, and this is incredible how the prices have changed and how this also affects, of course, the community and what is easily yeah, accessible course. especially internationally um yeah yeah and and it, it also increased the uh, how can i say it like the frauds because mm -hmm. people is selling like uh badly repaired cameras or mm -hmm. in 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 with the bad condition inside they only make up the outside and sell it uh yeah super expensive and then you you get you, you get surprises like very bad surprises and it, it could be a very bad experience for someone that is getting into film photography and gets this kind of uh, experience and it is like uh, back drawing i think yeah Yeah, that is true. Um, especially if you're new to film, um, where you're already busy understanding all of it and maybe getting your first roles back and they are badly exposed. And if you then have it in addition to yeah. that effects that are related to the camera, like a light meter not working properly or a shutter not working properly and you have elements of the shutter in the frame and all that can happen. And yeah, exactly as you as you said. Um, and for me personally, I'm I'm lucky here because um, Jules, who's also contributing to the channel and one of the three who are run running the channel, he's great with cameras and repairing them and understanding them. And I learned a lot from just looking at what he's doing and how he's thinking of cameras. And sometimes just handing yeah. him over um, one of my um, cameras, or sometimes he just takes them and says, "Oh, this one needs a cleaning," <laughs> and then he, he cleans them and, and I get it back, and I completely understand immediately what he did and how it affects the camera. And of course, this also changed how I look at used cameras on the market. But especially if you look at eBay and other platforms where you just go online shopping, I completely agree. It's incredibly hard to make a fair assessment of whether something is a genuine article or might, as you said, just be fraud or um, yeah, right. yeah. not and in well and a, scam, and a scammer or something like that. Uh, if you're new in film photography, maybe you you will see or you will get in some scam with, uh, I don't know, if you are looking from uh, like a camera, you you can find on, on eBay a lot of like a cameras, but uh, they are uh, fed, uh, fed cameras painted and mm -hmm. they look very very strange very i don't know very uh, ugly i think because like i have this uh, aesthetic and this clean aesthetic and you can you can show that that camera is not a leica but if you're a new photographer in in this new uh, wave of film photography you can get in that scam and you can yeah. buy something like that But, but here I think um, my main recommendation would be like with every new hobby, just take it slowly and read a lot. <laughs> That's at least my approach because yeah. to, to have a certain sense of awe, so to speak, um, and, and not just jump into the hobby. That makes sense maybe if you have um, something that you can really get inexpensively where you would say, okay, for very little money, I can get a point and shoot or something, then I, I think it's fine. But for the larger investments, I would always recommend to just read the great sources that are out there. Like for me, back at the time, it was um, 30 millimeter compact.com. Uh, so the, um, yeah. 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 
um, the Hamif's page. And um, that was incredibly helpful to read through all of his Leica M reviews and understand what are the differences, <laughs> what are the frame lines, what are the different viewfinders and viewfinder magnifications, um, how did it all evolve over time? Yeah. And then slowly but surely understand what are my own needs, what do I want, what do I not want? and and this i think is so important instead of just jumping in and say oh everyone wants an m6 so i also want one this i think is, is not the right approach and because because you might end up just purchasing, purchasing something that is incredibly expensive and breaks down after two weeks um so oh. yeah <laughs> yeah i i think it is a little bit easier for people who who's getting into film photography right now because the community has grown and, and the, it's a very united community and, That's true. and it is a an international community because uh thanks to i don't know the pandemics or or whatever this this kind of, of connections re really started to develop uh more and and that it's good for the community and it's good for the people that it's just starting and i think it's a a, a i don't want to say it, it is a dependency but that people that is, is starting are the people that, that are going to support the film community afterwards. And, and that people is the people that the business need because um, the film uh, industries need to film to get by, to get bought. I don't know. Um, cameras, we don't have companies that make cameras otherwise that like, like uh, I think. But... Um, with the film industry, we need to buy a lot of new film because if otherwise, if they, they, those companies are gonna are gonna end up closing. Yeah, we're actually yeah. in the process of, of creating a video that at least briefly touches that topic, and we're also thinking about a new format that discusses that whole topic of camera rep restoration and repair a bit more. And you, you might have seen that recently. That um, I think it's a Swedish or Finnish um, the camera rescue project. Yeah, um, camera rescue. Finnish. Yeah, yeah. Finnish. Yeah, yeah, yeah Finnish. Yeah, they, they set out originally, right? I think until the end of last year, to repair 100,000 cameras, and they re recently, with a slight delay, reached that amazing goal. And for me, that is so important to to keep mentioning that to the community to say, okay, um, it's economically much more efficient and makes more sense to have um, yeah to repair these old cameras that were built often in really high quality instead of waiting for a manufacturer to create everything they need to create um, new cameras on the same level. And there are sometimes like uh, Nikon did that right with the F6 and, and stuff that were still available for a long time. Leica is still doing it, basically building them by hand and having customers pay for that. Um, but then you have uh, for a long time, nothing. And then you have lomography and, and all that. And, and quality wise, I think for very little money, you can get a great 1970s, 80s um, single lens yeah. reflex camera. Um, that will last for quite a while if you um, have it a little bit cleaned and put in some, some yeah, yeah. Um, just give it a little bit of love and then you can use it for quite a while and yeah. it will yeah. be much more efficient than waiting for anybody. And so for me, that skill and, and spreading the word about these skills and um, even having camera repair videos is, I think, really, really important. And we just recently had a case where it was helpful to us to look at another camera repair video that was already on YouTube to see how a certain, in this case, a shutter was reassembled um, inside a, um, um, an Olympus 35RD. And that was really interesting to, <laughs> to see. Yeah. Okay, you can actually benefit from, from other people's knowledge, even on that very um small scale yeah. exactly yeah i wanted to to mention something uh, talking about restoration and, and camera repairs and i'm gonna do it the, the wrong way because i'm gonna show my myself into the camera but this account on instagram it's called adrian prada from colombia it's a, a colombian um mm. i don't i don't know if if he's a repair camera repair guy or or just paints them but he he transforms cameras and, yeah. and oh, nice. oh come on oh shit it's like Shuido from ja from japan or hong kong something like yeah. that I, I just wanted to mention that yeah i'm always really yeah, impressed yeah, yeah. of what they're doing and yeah this looks also really nice um whoa. yeah he's doing whoa, whoa, whoa. a, wow. a okay. great great awesome awesome wow. 
paint job and restoration, you should follow him. I, I, I'll send you mm -hmm. his his account. It's yeah, great. So. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how even they paint with that precise. Uh, it, it looks like 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 it was just <laughs> <Nice>. recently. <laughs> Yeah, it was made like 10 minutes ago in a yeah. beautiful, beautiful craft, craftsmanship. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this yeah, is kind of what I tried to touch on earlier when I, when I mentioned looking at how Jules repairs cameras with the watchmaker tools and all the little uh, yeah. crews and being yeah. very orderly about it. It's so exciting and so interesting. And suddenly it also makes much more sense, right? How a compact camera works and what kind of engineering feed it is. And also how you can potentially repaint it and it would still um, look as, as new, right? It's just yeah. a lot of work and taking really that part out and yeah, getting a paint job on it. <laughs> so. Yeah, actually yeah, yeah. it looks a lot like Shoido um, painted cameras, but uh, mm -hmm. it's like, it's like uh, I don't know, it's, for me it's a magnificent work. It looks amazing. It's, it have this uh, crazy colors combination is very that it's very appeal from some photographers and some not but it's it's amazing it's an amazing work actually no. so uh, max um okay. talking about your videos i saw a video also in your in your channel that it's um uh, you're well, no, well it's repairing a leica you are repairing mm -hmm. a Leica, and you are talking about that right now. H how do you uh, approach approach to these topics? How do you do these videos? How do you do uh, a script? Uh, mm -hmm. so suddenly you say, um, okay, I will do a review from this camera because I have it. So how how, how is your process? The original process was very straightforward. It was basically um, two formats in the beginning. Um, either I have a piece of gear that could be a lens or a camera and then reviewing it. And here I tried, as briefly touched on, to work more like a journalist and aggregate as much information as possible, share my personal impression at a certain point in the video, but really disconnect it from the factual part. That was one format, and then there was a story behind the shoot format that is more like a behind the scenes of, of um, yeah, film um, portrait sessions. And over time, I started to create additional formats together with Greg and Jules. Um, one was um, related to the photo books in Greg's library. Um, yeah. that, that is something, and now we will um, probably soon have a new format around um, camera restoration and so forth and so what is happening is that i constantly look for potential topics um and and have a fairly long list of and backlog of, of of cameras and potential topics and then when i say okay we really focus now on creating one of these videos um it is a lot of work and there's always a google doc for each of the videos um i collect first all the research um i Sometimes have Greg sends me um, old brochures, um, original brochures from <laughs> the 70s, 80s, or whenever he bought a camera. And um, I look through them, often in German, by the way, um, especially for the, for the um, yeah, most of his gear. And um, that is a fairly large research part. And then there's this one moment where I uh, print it all out, um, uh, basically a, f a final written text um, that would work as a voiceover. And then I sit down here in the corner of my living room and record that um, section by section. It's already well prepared. It's um, not, I don't know it by heart basically, but it's close to that. So I don't improvise when talking, but it's more like structured. <laughs> And uh, yeah, this is the, that research part. And in addition to that, for gear, we always try to um, go out on photo walks, um, at least one that is interesting, maybe even if it makes sense for the gear, do a studio session or something like that, or go for landscape photography or a portrait session. If I do lens reviews, I typically try to do a bit more, so to, to test them over a longer period of time so that I have a lot of different material, black and white and color and all that. And that, of course, formed over time through community feedback when people said, oh, nice, now you reviewed this lens, but you didn't show me a single color shot. <laughs> and just because I like black and white, it doesn't mean that uh, this is a good idea to review a lens like that. 
and uh, these kinds of learnings. So, so this is typically the process. Um, a, a lot of research, um, a lot of structured work on the, on the um, main text, and then um, yeah, the final editing, um, where I always start with these building blocks and then try to select fitting music and build the rest around it. So this would be the, the typical structure. In the case of that Leica video, it was different. Um, it was um, just experiencing that of having it passed on to me um, and having that experience with Jules. And only when it became clear that the reparation works, I decided, okay, let's do that. Let's turn that into a story. And here it was largely driven by storytelling. So how, what would make it most interesting for the viewer? And the main point was, of course, not showing the finished repaired product in the beginning or the camera, but really show how it came originally and then slowly, slowly building that story so that people would be curious to see it and then only show, oh, now we're out on a photo walk with the over 80, year, 80 years old camera and it's actually creating great images. With this, with this uh, format, which do you enjoy the most? Uh, that's difficult. Um, people uh -huh. ask a lot about the um, story behind the shoot and that I really enjoyed in the past, but it is uh, so much work. It is an incredible <laughs> amount of work to organize it because you typically need somebody who's doing hair and makeup. You need a model. You need Jules and myself to be available on the same day, the same slot. Yeah. You need the weather to play along. You need a location. You need a concept. Um, what do I want to shoot? Um, and you need moods. What inspires me? You need um, to align sometimes with the agency of the model. If it's a test shooting, can I use that person in a video? and all mm -hmm. that and because of all that um <clears throat> by the time we get busier jules and i um for various reasons um we kind of uh, yeah discontinued that or only very rarely <laughs> okay. do that anymore <laughs> or sometimes what we do now and we'll also have in upcoming videos to rather include sections of of a studio shoot for instance into a camera review if it makes sense for a hustle blood or something like that um, instead of making all the effort just for a story behind the shoot. Because what is really interesting is that these videos are, of course, viewed the least, but appreciated yep. quite a lot by the community because you, you learn by watching and by observing how is somebody else doing that. How am I metering the light uh, on site? Um, what light meter am I using? How am I positioning the model with respect to the light and the, the natural light and all that? You can learn a lot and that's what makes it popular. And it also has a voyeuristic um, appeal, um, <laughs> yeah. but, but you end up having 2000 views or 5,000 views. And of course, reviewing some Leica gear um, <laughs> that significantly contributes to the channel's success and visibility and increase in viewership, subscribership and so forth. So you need to have that balance of things that we really do for us. Um, sometimes also more philosophical formats where it's just me talking and reflecting on photography. I forgot to mention that earlier or the book reviews that also don't get a lot of, uh, oh, yeah. views, but we do it for us because um, it's typically an opportunity <laughs> for me to learn something from Greg exactly. um, yeah. and, and to listen to him and to share that with, with other people. Yeah. And actually, you have. Uh, I saw a lot of your videos. You are always with, well, not always, but constantly with Jules. You are getting on a, I don't know, walk, walk, uh, photo walk, sorry. So you are getting this kind of videos that you take a gear or a kind of film and you get out to take photos and, and say your impression about that. And actually, some of your videos that I enjoyed the most was the one with the Fujika GS645, because mm -hmm. you, because of you and Kai McDougall, I bought uh, that camera. Nice. So... Nice. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's your fault, actually. So. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hear that all the time. I, I get... <laughs> so many Instagram messages saying, Oh, because of you, um, I bought so many cameras or you get, com you should get commissions from eBay because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. whenever a video goes up, I, I tend to buy it. Or sometimes people complain now, thank you for reviewing it. Now the prices will go up and skyrocket. <laughs> exactly. 
<laughs> and, and yeah, this is the typical comment. And I'm, I'm kind of aware of that, what we're doing, but I'm also not trying to push that or do that. Um, yeah. It, and believe me, it's really tricky to enjoy a photo walk where you know you're filming it and you need to create images that kind of stand the community's judgment. And I had that in the past where people yeah. really complained about the quality of the photos saying they are boring or, oh, you just wasted a roll of film and then comments <laughs> like that. Oh, uh, come on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so they really take away a lot of the, the, the spirit and the joy of, of film photography. And um, to find that balance of, to make sure that it is fun for yourself and for us as yeah. a, as a creator group and still cater to the community with a certain quality. Um, this is also sometimes really tricky. And we did a lot of stuff already. We went into museums with large airplanes just to make it. Yeah, interesting. actually uh, that one, that one is with the Olympus OM1. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. This is also one really, I think it has 100,000 views by now or something. And yeah. back then for, for us, it was a fairly early video. And we just thought, hey, how about we do something really exciting today? It was Stuart's suggestion. And I was like, hey, I already prepared the text. Um, how about I do it on location? And we ended up having, I think, one of the most interesting videos because of all the switches um, of location mm -hmm. and narrating our basically day that we took the camera out and but again repeating something like that would be tremendously um, difficult and to put so much effort into it so it, i typically end up doing it here in my living room um, instead of on the same day yeah. <laughs> in the same museum with the same planes all the cameras <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you heard it back then right and you end up having a turtleneck on and, and your your microphone is scratching a little bit and then you have done that but and you need it for your storytelling to be there so yeah. you end up having a little note that says oh please excuse me for the bad sound here <laughs> and, and yeah and this is the kind of I, I i'm i tend to be more of a perfectionist and have a fairly high um yeah expectation when it comes to quality with respect to the uh, our own videos and and that always hurts me when i need to compromise somewhere but Yeah, <laughs> this is what yeah. you what you need to do. And we had so yeah. often we had mistakes with the cameras. Uh, once we drove all the way out to to Wetzlar to visit the Leica area yeah. with a Minolta camera and the Leica um, R3, I think it was um, Greg and I. And we ended up having shutter problems and um, light meter problems, and <laughs> and we showed no. the video, we showed the video, the footage, and the photos anyway, it's, and just said, "Hey, this is film photography; it can happen." Yeah, um, that that was a that was a mirror uh, mis error, right? That is like, exactly the, the mirror didn't completely the half. disappear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you remember all the videos. That's really yeah, impressive. actually, yeah, <laughs> actually, yeah. It's that's one is the comparison between the Minolta XE and mm -hmm. the Leica because they were, they are like sister because they were, were Minolta and Leica worked together for for a while, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, yeah, yeah, I remember that that video actually. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You, you, David. You had problems with your uh, Fujica, yeah, with light light leaks, right? Light leaks, ah. yeah, in the bellows yes. because uh, in the bellows. Uh, oh, yeah, oh. that's that's that sucks. But but I found uh, I found that the bellows in on eBay, so I can replace that. So right now it's it's cool. It's working fine, and for me it's one of the best lenses that i have because it's yeah. it's it is it is it's crazy that's fu that fujinon it's crazy it's yeah. i don't know and also uh you told me beto that it's uh, the best uh, the best scanning for a dslr it's with uh, 645 right yeah one of, one of the best f uh, formats for for dslr or mirrorless uh digitizing is the 645 because it it uh, almost fails the the, mm -hmm. the frame perfectly so you don't have to crop a lot so you get a lot of a lot of resolution it is great it's my my favorite format six or five and actually max which which is your your favorite uh, camera or format for a i don't know maybe a a uh, portrait session or uh, something like that that's a hard one I bet that's a really hard one but um i, I think it's the mamiya rz 67 is um, okay. I, i both love the 6x7 format 
And I love that camera in particular because I can get so close. Um, and because of the 110 millimeter um, lens and how it renders everything, this is just amazing for me. It's a beautiful camera. And it also creates a very special slowed down atmosphere um, during um, an editorial shoot, for instance, because you really take, at least I, I really take my time and with the composition and everything, and I can completely trust that camera. I, I used it on so many occasions and was always really um, happy with the results. So this is one of my go-to cameras when it when it comes to to editorials and film. And um, my other favorite camera, I think, is the the Leica M6. It's it's kind of lame and it's a classic. <laughs> um, but yeah, it for me using a rangefinder, especially in the streets, and uh, yeah, observing and then being very quick, focusing and and uh, just having no electronics that kind of interfere um, no no override no automatics um, and all that just that the camera does exactly what i want it to do this i really really like um, and of course a, any manual camera can do that but um, i really learned film photography with the m6 so this was the camera that taught me everything next to the xt7 and yeah that's why i get really used to it and still enjoy it to this day yeah, now that you say that, uh, I think the rangefinder have kind of a, a romantic, romantic feeling when focusing. It, it is great. I, I, I also prefer rangefinders yeah. over SLRs. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say that I prefer them in general. Um, sometimes, it, especially when I use um, wide-angle lenses, I really like to see what I'm what I'm getting. And here, I feel it's a bit tricky to to do it sometimes on a rangefinder and switching between focusing and actually the viewfinder. Yeah. But for a 50 millimeter, for instance, or a 35, I really love shooting a Leica and uh, I'm more of a 50 millimeter um, guy, um, but wider, getting wider than I prefer an SLR. Yeah. I recently bought a, a lens for my, I don't know if it's here, my Mamiya 645. It is a, Oh, nice. uh, 30, 35 millimeter lens. So on that format, it's super wide and it, it is yeah. <laughs> ki ki kind of tricky to, to focus, but I love that lens. It is beautiful. Yeah, I can and imagine. See, yeah. Let's see if I can reach it. Uh, one camera that I, that I saw on your YouTube channel, it's the F Fuji GF670. That it's, I know that it's very, very expensive, but yeah. you are... You are so lucky to shoot with it. Yeah, yeah. This, it's amazing. This, oh, this, this is amazing. This and is this thing nice. is is heavy. It's a lot of glass, but it is yeah. awesome. No, yeah, I, I can imagine. Camera is yeah, that's crazy. Um, yeah, the, the Fujika, this was also borrowed by a viewer. He reached out to us and said, okay, you want to use it? And of course, we jumped at the opportunity yeah. to have such a modern folding camera. Um, and the image quality is amazing. The, the images really stand out. Um, I think precisely because of that combination of a Fuji and that compact setup and, and all that, it's really excellent camera, but it's, yeah, it, it would be prohibitive to own such a camera <laughs> <laughs> and, and many more, right? It's for me, it's, it's a kind of camera. Um, and I think the person even mentioned, yeah, I, I took part of my, uh, what was it? Um, that is where he usually used to save for purchasing um, a house or something like that. And he used part of that money and, and reinvested it in that camera. And I was like, okay, interesting. Wow. <laughs> so it, it really needs some commitment to get into such a camera. And I think you need to be completely sure that this is what you want, and that you don't feel limited by the minimum focusing distance or, or things like that. And actually, that uh, that camera have the format is six by six and six uh, by seven, right? So yeah. that's that's very dynamic and very, very, very nice. It's uh, like nice, and also it's got the version, the Boitlander version, right? Because mm -hmm. it's the Besa Besa three. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 That's crazy. That camera is crazy. But but we want it. <laughs> we want it. We will save some money, right, Beto? <laughs> to take <Yeah>. the camera. <laughs> yeah, I can highly recommend it. It's just uh, yeah, incredibly expensive. Yeah, yeah incredibly expensive. <laughs> so, Max, um, what can you tell us about the film 
film scene in Germany? How is the film scene, photography film scene in, in Germany? I think my perspective is, of course, very subjective and um, uh, my information largely derives from what I get from Jules and from, from Greg. Um, I notice, at least on Instagram, that there are a lot of young people um, also in Germany getting into film photography and not in that um, hipster way, in a negative way, but more really, uh -huh. um, f really seriously um, in, in, in a similar fashion like I did um, when I initially started. So really burning through a lot of film, having... Um, expensive um, lab developments and scans and, and so forth um, <laughs> in order to really learn it and, and get great results and push themselves creatively, but also push um, what you can get out of the cameras. And at yeah. least in my observation, the quality of the conversation is fairly, fairly high and the nature of the conversations. And nevertheless, you have people um, getting freshly into the community and being embraced and welcomed and um, not spoken down to, but instead, yeah, here's a helping hand here. This is what you should start with here. Are a couple of videos to try. This is my observation that we have a very lively and good um, film community that is um, coming again. And nevertheless, I feel like there are a lot of older people with knowledge that is not really accessible anymore um and where we feel oh, yeah. Uh, yeah and where, where you can see at least um looking at greg and what he's doing in the dark room or um, also looking at jules who kind of made that transition and who acquired a lot of um, knowledge um there is i think in some areas especially lab work um not that much um yeah wide knowledge available um okay. in, the, in the overall film community. yeah yeah I think the tendency is more to, okay, I won't go to a grocery store to have my film developed and scanned, but go to more like a local lab or even develop my film myself and kind of the um, have uh, scan setups with a, as you mentioned briefly, Beto, with a um, mirrorless camera or have really yeah. good scanners at home. This kind of is, is what I observe a lot. But then the transition to the lab work and really doing proper prints, this to me seems like... Um, yeah, more like a territory that still needs some more um, work and uh, exploring and in the wider yeah. community, especially the younger ones, which of course is also the highest hurdle to really say, um, yeah, I either, even have a lab in my home or I have a possibility to darken my complete kitchen or whatever people are doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and then can actually yeah, have an enlarger um, bought somewhere. Um, this is at least my observation that I feel like this is the difficult transition, but finding young people who know exactly, oh yeah, this kind of camera flash things across the entire shutter speeds and explain you that and they're like 18 and you're like, okay, great. You, you watch a lot of videos. <laughs> yeah. um, that I see a lot. And even, even communities building on Instagram where they say, okay, we're the uh, analog collective is one that I can think of and, and similar things here in Germany. Yeah. yeah. So my very subjective assessment and, and I'm happy yeah, to see yeah. How is but, it in Mexico? It is it is incredibly similar. It is uh -huh. yeah. just like that. It is it, it's very interesting that you mentioned it because it is when it is a lot of knowledge in in cameras, lenses, films, uh, film stocks, and even uh, developing film at home. Yeah. But when it gets to the 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 how can I say that the the final lab work in printing. Um, more specifically in color color prints hmm. those are like knowledge that is it's not well spread i i think mm -hmm. but That's true. Yeah. but the, there there is people that that is doing this uh and they are are willingly to to uh to share that that knowledge we had in the last episode we recorded um this guy ripsy from from instagram and he's doing uh, color prints at home in his bathroom. Nice. And and he said it's not that difficult, but mm -hmm. it was difficult to get to that knowledge to to trial and error. It it, it it takes a lot of work to get there, but it it is possible. Yeah. yeah. And it's good that you mentioned that, right? It's always the same story. It's it's 
once you know how to do it, it's fairly simple. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Getting there is either you find that shortcut and find somebody who teaches you, or it's a lot of reading and getting to understand it. And this is what I meant. This, uh, and you, you summarized it beautifully in, in a couple of words. <laughs> um, this is kind of the, the territory where, where I feel we should exchange even more knowledge about, um, yeah, printing film or printing your, your negatives and uh, creating large prints and also then especially in color. Yeah. yeah, because that's the the way the that process was created. That that's what it meant to be, just to take your pictures, develop it and printing them. Because seeing seeing your pictures in a, a screen, even though you have the best uh, scanner, even you you have a, a frontier in, a, at home and you yeah. you scan that, it's not the same to see your photo yeah. printed. It it's yeah. completely it's like uh, finally, my, my photo, uh, I don't know. It comes to found, life. <laughs> yeah, it comes to life. Found its yeah. way to get physically in your hands. It is amazing. Yeah. I, I've done darkroom prints, but only black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish I, I, I could maybe at the, by the end of this year uh, start doing my own prints in color at home. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Sounds, sounds great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And... Uh, and that's that's something that you said, uh, Max. I, I I was wondering, but in Germany you have uh, like uh, companies like Adox and like uh, I don't know. Uh, you have this lab, uh, Mind Lab, Mind Film Lab, mm -hmm. that also did do this uh, professional work for printing on developed uh, film, and that's. I, I thought that maybe you will have in in Germany you will have more open uh, or or a wide uh, knowledge about it and I I thought it. it it might be but at least in my circles it's basically Jules and Greg because they've acquired that knowledge or especially Jules who just uh, is very. Uh, curious and uh, just purchases also machines to do that then yeah. um it's constantly looking for old labs that are being disassembled and where people are just making oh, yeah. a, a sale and you get um for very little money uh, complete machines and setups and he acquires that and has also room for that and but but for the general community my feeling is just as you said Beto, that uh Many people have a fairly good understanding of gear development, film stock, and all that, but it ends typically in that black and white development at home. Some even manage to do C41 or yeah. E6 with a couple of uh, yeah, kitchen utensils or whatever the people use to, to keep the temperature <laughs> right. Um, yeah. and, and then it ends, um, or they do um, yeah, black and white darkroom work and have their own prints. Yeah, at least my observation. I, I don't feel like a lot of people are doing that and on that level. And, and even looking at the frontiers, what you mentioned, it's always like, yeah, they're missing that mini lab part, which used to be yeah. next to the scanner, right? <laughs> Where the yeah, whole yeah. idea was of the workflow. Okay, finally you get your prints. And yeah, yeah, many people use it and only get that error message in the beginning. Oh, it's not attached. <laughs> so, yeah. Because they just yeah, want they, the frontier scanner. <laughs> For yeah, Instagram, the, the, the standalone version. Yeah. yeah. And also you, you have very, very close the Silver Salts uh, company, right? That develop mm -hmm. uh, motion picture, motion film picture that, um, with ECN2. So yeah. you try it, right? You try that? Uh, uh, yes, of course. We tried it, and it was a really exciting project. We we got a chance to visit them, and that was in their earlier mm -hmm. stages when they were still mostly hand developing everything they got internationally okay. and were in the process of building their own machine. And we also briefly showed during our reportage um, that machine that they built, um, completely custom made together with somebody who used to create such machines and has a very good understanding of the process. Wow. And that was super exciting to see how does ECN2 work and what is the difference to a C41? What are the additional um, things that need to be done? And then seeing how they created this incredibly large machine um, and see how reliably it can work, this was really impressive. So I, uh, if you're interested in that, um, also to the community, um, for me, this was mind blowing. And the video on the silver sides also connects it a little bit to um, the rise and fall of Kodak and the whole cinema scene. Oh, yeah. 
which directors today are still shooting on film and why that is and all that. So this is an interesting piece. And also for, for me, it was very interesting to acquire that knowledge and to talk to a DP. So real cameraman to, today who is still sometimes doing commercial videos on film, um, either black and white or, or oh. with, with Ari Alexa's um, on film. And even saying, hey, if that's a commercial project, the price is not that much more expensive for the client. Sometimes it's not at all. And um, we are just very limited in our production because we have um, uh, yeah, <laughs> not that much time to, to shoot. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I, I haven't heard of, of a ATP that it shoots commercial uh, on film. Yeah, that, that is impressive. Yeah, and, and yeah. it was also impressive to me and also to see the results. And it, I know it sounds, uh, yeah, stupid, but it, it actually makes a difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not stupid. It, it, it makes a difference, a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, Max, I, I think we, we are, 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 I think it's time to, to ask this. How many cameras did you have? How many cameras and lenses do you have? <laughs> you will be surprised. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's important. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think people will be surprised about that. I don't typically acquire a lot of cameras. So I acquired most of my cameras in the first one and a half or two years I went after starting out. And since then, I rather sold cameras instead of buying new ones. And if I bought a new one, it was more in the level of an Olympus Pen F that I wanted to review, or the original Olympus Pen, um, and that's it. So really inexpensive, small cameras, and I don't buy any gear because I have people around me who have great gear, like Greg yeah. and Jules, or a lot of people in the community offering me to... Um, give their cameras a try and review them. So this is kind of the advantage that I have that I'm very satisfied with the cameras I purchased. I feel like I purchased them early enough when they were not crazy expensive. <laughs> yeah. Amelia RZ67 at the time was already a huge investment for me. The Leica M6 was a huge investment for me. Um, but everything else kind of came to me as you could hear. Um, and I got really lucky there. And I even sold uh, my Mamiya 647 um, Pro T uh, 645 um, Pro TL, for instance, um, at some point because I felt like okay, I have enough other cameras. So, yeah. so <laughs> this is rather the trend that I get rid of something and not really purchase um, new stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm yeah. Not, not as gear acquisition syndrome um, like as you might expect when you look at all the reviews that we, we do all the time. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I thought that you have all that cameras and all that kind of stuff and <laughs> your fridge, your fridge are, are full of film and something like that. <laughs> that is true. I have ah, okay. <laughs> the, the bottom of my fridge, I have a fairly large fridge and the bottom is um, completely stacked with, with film and all the time. <laughs> so I always try to keep, keep a lot of stuff in stock um, to be flexible. Um, but yeah, camera wise, I'm pretty okay, I think. Yeah. So... Max, we we're gonna do uh, the last uh, part of the interview. It's a a little game, little dynamic. Uh, so it's it's just questions. That uh, what would you prefer? Mm -hmm. um, so let's start. Okay, Beto. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, uh, Max. What do you prefer? A portrait session in a snowy day or in a sunny day? A sunny day. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. If you want to add something, it's you're free to do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, oh, that's that's your dog. <laughs> yeah, that's maybe, maybe, dog. maybe I, I did a sunny, I did a snowy day um, portrait session once, um, and you can see that on on YouTube, um, and that was incredibly cold. I even did twice, did it twice. So um, you you might want to check that out. Okay. And based on these experiences and needing to work really really fast, um, I would always prefer a sunny oh, yeah. day. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> so, next question: What do you prefer, a car size lens or a cosina lens? A car size. Perfect. Yeah, I know it's it's car size. <laughs> car size, just because. Just because. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, well, which do you prefer? The decisive moment or scent of a dream? Uh, the decisive moment. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Cartier Bresson all the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, a Leica CL or a Minolta CLE? A Minolta CLE. Yeah. Okay. That's a better camera, interestingly. Yeah. Okay, next one. Camera also. A Minolta XD7 or a Olympus OM1? Uh, an Olympus OM1 is for me the purer camera. Um, so if you're a purist, check out our review of the Olympus OM1. It's uh, yeah, a, a fabulous camera. It's a lot of fun. And also a compact. Okay. It's one of the compact yeah. SLR ever. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, what do you prefer, ad hoc film or Rolay film? Ad hoc. Perfect. Okay. Uh, which do you prefer, Ilford or Kodak? Ilford, sorry to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that's a, a, a no-brainer, yeah. <laughs> okay, next question. Um, beer or coffee? Coffee, definitely. <laughs> nice. Great. I, I ran out of coffee, but I, I will refill <laughs> soon. <laughs> and the last question, uh, which do you prefer, the Fuji GF 670 or Mamiya 7? Mamiya 7. Okay. Because, that... because uh, the lenses or what? Yes, the interchangeable lenses. Yeah. yeah. That sounds very... That sounds obvious because <laughs> you can change your yeah your lenses and your perspective of the photos. Yeah. That's nice. But it, yeah. I, I don't like the prices of both cameras, so... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That is, that's crazy. <laughs> well... <laughs> Max, something that you want to add to this uh, interview, something like that? I, I had a great time with you guys. It was really, really interesting. I, I uh, yeah, sh maybe should have asked a bit more about you guys <laughs> because that little bit of just hearing how is it in Mexico was really interesting to me and uh, I really enjoyed it. So, um, yeah, and, and for everyone who doesn't know the channel so far, so Analog Insights, please... Um, head over to analog insights and browse through our latest videos um, we try to keep a great mix of different content and uh, maybe there's something in it for you as well yeah right. you're doing a great job so we are as, as i said earlier we are thankful for that and yeah thank you for for making this community closer and, and bigger Thank yeah. you. That's that's what what we are trying to to do. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And you guys do a great job as well. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank Max. you. Thank you. Thank you a lot. So Max, thank you very much. That's this was very very interesting. And very we're very happy to have you this this time. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your time. Let's uh, keep in touch and take care. Yeah. You too. Let me know if you need anything. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Max. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye bye. See bye. ya.